Once more. The next item in the order paper is a legislative consent motion for the Environment Bill. I ask the clerk to read the motion. That this Assembly endorses the principle of the extension to Northern Ireland of the provisions of the Environment Bill, as introduced on 30th of January 2020, dealing with environmental governments, Northern Ireland, in clauses 45 and 46, and schedules 2 and 3, waste and resource efficiency in clauses 47 to 53, 56, 58, 62, 64 and 68, and schedules 4 to 9, water quality in clauses 81 and 83, and amendment of reach legislation in clause 125 and schedule 19. I would ask the Minister for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs to formally move the motion. I beg to move. Again for this debate. And I invite the Minister to open the debate on the motion. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I am grateful for the opportunity to bring this motion forward today and to speak about an issue that affects us all. The Environment Bill is a UK Government Bill containing a range of clauses, some of which apply UK-wide and some to England only, and some to Northern Ireland and other devolved jurisdictions. A number of matters covered by the Bill are reserved and as such do not require the consent of the Assembly for the UK Government to legislate at Westminster. Transfrontier shipment of waste is an example. However, the environment in general is a devolved matter, and hence most of the clauses of the Bill that apply to Northern Ireland do require the Assembly's consent. At this point, I would like to record my appreciation of the work carried out by the Committee on Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs in completing its report under difficult circumstances for the benefit of this Assembly. The original intention of the Bill was to address the environmental governance gaps that will be created at the end of the EU withdrawal transition period, in particular the absence of the environmental oversight rule currently undertaken by the European Commission and the environmental principles embedded in the EU treaties. The UK Government published a draft bill in December 2018 which addressed these specific points and also gave a statutory footing for its 25-year plan for the environment. Subsequent iterations of the bill included a range of other environmental matters, some of which are driven by EU withdrawal, while others seek to maintain existing UK-wide systems. A bill has been drafted so as not to constrain the ability of the Assembly to scrutinise a bill. This is a key point. With one exception, the provisions dealing with the devolved matters in Northern Ireland can only be implemented after being debated and approved in this chamber. That one exception, a power to amend specific chemicals legislation had to be made for technical reasons and would still require the approval of DERA before it could be implemented here. It is my general view that, where possible, devolved matters should be legislated for by this Assembly. However, in the case, uh, this case, there simply is not the time to deliver fully considered Northern Ireland legislation before the end of the transition period. Failure to take this opportunity to keep open the options presented by this UK Bill would be detrimental to environmental governments and safeguards in Northern Ireland. To be clear, this does not constrain the Assembly from enacting additional or alternative Northern Ireland legislation relating to any of the devolved matters in the Bill in the future. There are 17 clauses and nine associated schedules for which legislative consent is sought. These cover a range of environmental matters, including improving the natural environment, environmental oversight, waste, resource efficiency, water and chemicals. I will start with the relevant provisions within Part 2 of the Bill, which relate to environmental governance. Clause 45 gives effect to Schedule 2, which is split into two parts. Part 1 provides for the arrangements for the development and management of environmental improvement plans, and Part 2 outlines the means by which the environmental principles currently enshrined in the Treaty on the functioning of the EU can be incorporated into Northern Ireland law and subsequently policy making. More specifically, Part 1 provides for first the preparation, review, revision and renewal of environmental improvement plans, and secondly the collection of data to assist with monitoring progress on environmental and improvement plans. This allows plans to improve the natural environment to be placed on a statutory footing. Part 2 allows for the preparation and publication of a statement on the interpretation and application of relevant environmental principles. 
to which Northern Ireland departments and UK government ministers must have regard when making policy in respect of Northern Ireland. This would allow us to address the gaps in arrangements relating to environmental principles as a result of departure from the EU. Clause 46 concerns the Office for Environmental Protection and gives effect to Schedule 3, which allows this body to exercise its functions in Northern Ireland. Its broad role is to replace the environmental oversight function of the European Commission, holding public bodies to account for any failure to comply with environmental law. The provisions of Schedule 3 gives the OEP operating in Northern Ireland broadly similar powers to the OEP operating in England. These powers would allow the OEP to monitor the implementation of environmental law and progress in improving the natural environment in accordance with any environmental improvement plans agreed by the Executive, provide Northern Ireland departments with advice, for example, on any proposed changes to environmental law, and investigate any failures by public authorities in Northern Ireland to comply with environmental law, taking appropriate enforcement action when necessary. This would allow us to address an obvious environmental governance gap as a result of departure from the EU. At this point, it is appropriate to advise members that it is my understanding that the UK Government intends to table a small number of amendments to the provisions relating to the OEP when the Westminster Committee stage resumes. I have not yet had the opportunity to consider the proposals fully, and obviously it would not be appropriate for me to announce UK Government policy, but I can say that these amendments are intended to clarify the OEP's role. I will be considering whether similar amendments would also be desirable for Northern Ireland and will advise executive colleagues and the ERA committee as appropriate. Should any amendments to Northern Ireland's provisions proposed during the Bill's passage through Parliament fall outside the scope of this motion, a further legislative consent motion would of course be tabled in accordance with the requirements of the relevant standing orders. Part 3 of the Bill contains provisions on waste and resource efficiency. Clause 47 gives effect to Schedule 4, which deals with producer responsibility, obliging businesses that place certain specified products or materials on the market to take greater responsibility for those products or materials once they have become waste. The Environmental Bill provides the means through which the UK-wide producer responsibility schemes can be replaced and updated, and new obligations can be placed on producers in relation to reuse, redistribution, recycling, and recovery of products. For Northern Ireland, Schedule 4 confers powers on DERA to make new regulations under which producer responsibility obligations can be imposed on specified persons and in relation to specified products and materials. It also provides for enforcement of these regulations. Clause 47 also repeals the producer responsibility obligations, uh, which is no longer required alongside the provisions of Schedule 4. These provisions will allow me as Minister to keep producer responsibility schemes operable and are reformed or to introduce new schemes alongside the rest of the UK. Clause 28 gives effect to Schedule 5, which also deals with producer responsibility, conferring powers and DERA to make Northern Ireland regulations, which may require those involved in the manufacture, processing, distribution or supply of products or materials to pay for or contribute to costs of disposing of those items when they become waste. It also provides for the enforcement of those regulations. This provision is designed to incentivise producers to design their products with sustainability in mind, with the aim of ultimately reaching, con reducing consumption of raw materials. Clause 49 gives effect to Schedule 6 and is concerned with resource efficiency information, allowing DERA to make product-specific uh, regulations, mm -hmm. setting requirements to provide information about a product's resource efficiency. It also provides for enforcement arrangements. This provision is designed to require clear labelling on products to enable consumers to identify those which are more durable, repairable and recyclable. Clause 50 gives effect to Schedule 7 and also relates to resource efficiency. Under this provision, DERA can make regulations setting requirements for specific products, resource efficiency. Enforcement arrangements are also provided for. Alongside Schedule 6, these provisions are intended to encourage more sustainable and efficient use of materials. Clause 51, Schedule 8, uh, into effect, or brings into effect and deals with deposit and return schemes. This provision allows DERA to make regulations 
to establish and enforce deposit schemes in Northern Ireland. Under these schemes, consumers can pay an upfront deposit when they buy an item, for example, a drink and a bottle or can, which is then redeemed when the used item is returned. These schemes can reduce littering and increase recycling and reuse. Under Clause 47 to 51 inclusive, regulations from Northern Ireland may also be made by the Secretary of State for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, but only with DERA's consent. An obvious example of where this might be granted would be where there is agreement on the benefit of taking a UK-wide approach to a particular scheme. Clause 52 and its associated Schedule 9 allow DERA to make regulations for Northern Ireland relating to charging for a range of single-use plastic items by sellers of goods and services. It also provides for the enforcement of those regulations, including the imposition of civil, civil sanctions, as intended to build upon the success of the charge for carrier bags. Clause 53, insofar as it relates to Northern Ireland, amends Schedule 6 of the Climate Change Act to allow DERA to make regulations requiring sellers of carrier bags to register with an administrator. The regulations may also make provision about applications for registration, the period of registration, the cancellation of registration, and the payment of registration fees, including the amount. Clause 56, new powers to create uh, establish a mandatory electronic system to record and monitor the movement of waste. It also includes powers to impose fees and charges and to create associated criminal offences and civil penalties for the breaches of any regulations made under the powers. This provision aims to improve the management and tracking of waste, therefore assisting the detection and reduction of waste crime in Northern Ireland. Clause 58 updates the powers available to DERA in respect of the regulation of hazardous waste. This includes providing for the imposition of civil sanctions in respect of contraventions of regulations and updating of fixed penalty amounts which can be applied in relation to offences. Clause 62 includes new powers to allow for fees to be charged to recover costs in relation to waste management licensing uh, producer responsibility schemes. The powers will enable the fees and charges to be updated by way of a charging scheme. Charging for regulatory activities carried out reduces the burden on general taxation. This clause aims to ensure that the costs associated with enforcement activity in Northern Ireland are appropriately covered, a practical application of the polluter pays principle. Clause 64 ensures that the Department will have powers to direct a registered carrier to collect specified waste and to deliver it to a specified site. This addresses a gap in the current legislation with respect to the removal of harmful waste from a site and a safe treatment or disposal. Clause 68 is a technical amendment to ensure the amendments to the Waste and Contaminated Land Northern Ireland Order 1997 by the Env Environment Bill, which will confer functions in DERA rather than the former Department of Environment. I now turn to Part 5 of the Bill, provisions relating to the water environment. Clauses 81 provides a regulation making power for DEFRA Secretary of State to make provision about the substances to be taken into account in assessing the chemical status of surface water or groundwater, mm -hmm. and to specify standards for those substances or in relation to the chemical status of the water bodies. Where those regulations could be made under DERA's own powers, under Clause 83, then the DEFRA Secretary of State must obtain DERA's consent. This provision will ensure that after the transition period, the UK will still be able to update the list of priority uh, hazardous substance and specify uh, standards. Clause 83 that I have just mentioned confers the same powers in DERA in relation to Northern Ireland to make regulations about the substances to be taken into account in assessing the chemical status of surface water or groundwater and to specify standards for those substances or in relation to the chemical status of water bodies. Again, this will ensure that Northern Ireland can continue to update the list of priority um, and priority hazardous substances and specify standards after the end of the transition period. Part 8 of the Bill provides or covers miscellaneous and general provisions and includes a final provision for which I will seek legislative consent. Clause 125 gives effect to Schedule 19, which allows DEFRA Secretary of State to make regulations to amend two pieces of retained European Union law relating to registration, evaluation, authorisation and restriction of chemicals, generally referred to as REACH. 
These are the REITs Regulation and the REITs Enforcement Regulations 2008. The Secretary of State <coughs> cannot make such regulations without the consent of the devolved administrations, including DERA, and is also required to consider any request by a relevant devolved authority to make regulations. The schedule also confers a power on DERA and or the Department for the Economy to amend REITs Enforcement Regulations 2008 independently of DEFRA Secretary of State. While that concludes the list of provisions for which legislative consent is being sought, I would also like to highlight the commencement provisions contained within Clause 131 to reinforce the point that I made earlier about the implementation of these provisions being subject to the consent or approval of the Assembly. With the exception of Clause 125 and its associated Schedule 19, all of the provisions that I have outlined to you today require the Assembly's approval of a draft commencement order before being brought into operation. Members will therefore quite rightly have the opportunity to debate the merits of this Bill's provisions before bringing them into force. Our environment is precious in its own right, but it also contributes significantly to our economic prosperity and the physical and mental health of our citizens. So it deserves to be properly protected and improved for the benefit of all. And I believe the provisions of this Bill that I have highlighted will help us to achieve that. Accordingly, I commend the motion to the House. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I call on the Vice Chair of the Agricultural, Environment and Rural Affairs Committee, Philip McGuigan. Karen Hoggart, uh, last time caller. As Vice Chairperson of the Committee of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, I welcome the opportunity uh, to speak today to outline the views of the Committee in relation to the LCM on the Environment Bill. And I thank the, the Minister uh, for his words of thanks to the Committee uh, with regard to this work and the report that it produced. Uh, Minister Putz has outlined the Bill, which contains 133 clauses and 19 schedules, many of which apply to the North. Legislative consent has been sought on these provisions that relate to devolved matters. These are outlined in the LCM and in the Committee report. As members will be aware, uh, much existing environmental policy and legislation derives from the EU and is monitored, monitored and enforced by EU institutions. Uh, the Environmental Bill aims to provide a new framework for environmental governments as a result of Brexit. Uh, the Bill also provides for environmental improvement in respect of a number of specific areas. I wish to make clear that the Committee had very little time to scrutinise and fully consider uh, the implications of the Bill. The provisions that apply to the North are detailed and complex. Uh, what is more, the Bill is the reintroduction of the 2019 Bill, which was developed when this jurisdiction was without an Executive or a sitting Assembly. There has been no formal public consultation on the environmental plans, principles and government elements of the Bill here. This is something that concerns the Committee particularly given the importance of the environment for everyone living, working or visiting here. I will now outline uh, the Committee's approach to scrutiny of the Bill. Uh, the Committee took oral and written evidence in an all-day meeting on the 27th of February 2020. We heard from a range of stakeholders and their evidence can be found on our website. This evidence has been invaluable uh, in our scrutiny. The Committee also commissioned a briefing paper on the Environmental Bill from the Assembly Research and Information Service. The paper was also very helpful uh, and it too can be found on the website. In considering the evidence, a number of key issues were identified by the Committee. The first issue is that the Environmental Bill is a piece of Westminster legislation which prov with provisions for the North. As mentioned earlier, the Bill provides a framework for governance and for the production of environmental regulations in a number of areas. Many of the policy principles forming the Bill were consulted on in the absence of an executive. Neither Scotland nor Wales are participating in the principles and governance aspects of this bill. They are making their own separate arrangements. DERA have indicated that they do not currently have plans to bring forward an environmental bill uh, for the North. However, the committee is of the view that an environmental bill for here uh, should be developed locally, taking into account the unique circumstances and would better deliver environmental governance and improve improvement locally. For example, we have a border uh, with rivers, lakes, pollution and waste crime which ha have no regard for. We are subject to the Irish Protocol, yet this Bill fails to take account of these important matters. And so the Committee recommends a standalone bespoke environmental bill for the North. 
Although a consensus was not reached, the Committee recommends that a sunset clause be included uh, in this Bill for the provisions relating to the jurisdiction, uh, and for this jurisdiction and that an Environment Bill be brought before the Assembly. Not all Committee members shared this view, as I am sure you will hear later. The second issue raised by the Committee is the potential weakening of environmental protection provisions or regression. It has been argued that the Environmental Bill does not appear to have the same protections as those provided currently by the EU. Whilst refuted by the Department, the potential for lowering of environmental standards exists. Stakeholders have identified a number of areas where this risk arises and have raised concerns that the Bill does not contain a specific provision on non-regression for the North. The Committee is concerned by this. It is critically important that there should be no environmental regression. The North, should, the North should act as an exemplar and should set the highest possible benchmark for delivering clearly defined significant improvements to the natural environment. This should be applied to every department and across all policies. The Committee recommends that a specific non-regression clause for the North be included in the Bill to ensure no weakening of environmental protection provisions occurs, not least because of the protocol which I, I will now turn to. The North is required to adhere to the Irish Protocol. It, also, it is also required to automatically adopt any changes to the EU environmental regulations listed in Annex 2 of the Protocol. New regulations can be added to the Annex, yet the Bill makes no reference to the Protocol. This could have serious implications, not only in terms of environmental standards, but also in relation to access to the EU single market. As time progresses, any divergence between here and the EU legislation uh, as a result of the Bill could have implications for for example, in the agri-food sector. Whilst the Bill aims to address governance gaps that may, may arise as a result of Brexit, the Committee has real concern that governance gaps may still arise. With six months to go, time is very limited. Uh, sorry, with six months to go, time is very limited to ensure appropriate governance is in place. Stakeholders too have expressed concern at the potential for governance gaps. The Committee has also noted that the Bill makes no mention of an independent environmental protection agency proposed in the New Decade New Approach Deal. How will this and other bodies with a role in environmental protection uh, fit in? The Committee also has concerns around enforcement and penalties. For example, the Office of Environmental Protection does not have powers to fine uh, here in the North. There is little to deter those who pollute or dump waste illegally. The devastating impact of pollution on the natural environment and on the wider community are not reflected in the fines imposed on those who pollute. The rewards of waste crime seem to greatly outweigh the penalties. Enforcement, and particularly the level of fines, could be much stronger. I will now move to the clauses in the Bill that the Committee had issues with. Clause 45 introduces Schedule 2, which includes provision for environmental improvement plans and policy statements on environmental principles here in the North. The Committee noted that this Assembly does not currently have an environmental improvement plan to significantly improve the natural environment. Stakeholders expressed concern at the lack of this environmental improvement plan. The Committee recommends that an environmental improvement plan be developed, subject to full public consultation and includes targets. In relation to the policy statement environmental principles, stakeholders have also indicated that these should be strengthened. Clause 46 introduces Schedule 3. This allows for an Office of Environmental Protection, or OEP, to be extended here. It is proposed that the OEP will replace the oversight of the European Commission. The Committee has a lot of questions about the OEP around representation on the OEP, its role, enforcement, its independence, funding and scrutiny of the OEP. This, there is concern that the OEP will just be looking at public bodies, that there are restrictions on who can report and that the judicial review is the only means of enforcement of the OEP. Stakeholders raised a lot of concerns on questions about the OEP too, including how the OEP will operate. As noted earlier, time is running out. If the Office for Environmental Protection is to be established here, uh, this needs to happen as a matter of urgency. The Committee recommends that the OEP be extended here in the north uh, with a base located uh, here and that there should be adequately and it should be adequately resourced. There should be an interim member uh, from the north until the OEP becomes operational to avoid a governance gap. Restrictions on who can report to the OEP should be removed, and the ability to impose fines should be included, and that the maximum degree of independence should be ensured. Clauses 47 and 48 cover producer responsibility. 
However, these clauses do not address the potential for this to encourage cross-border waste crime. Stakeholder concerns with these provisions inc included that they are too focused on end-of-life solutions and, there needs to be, and that there needs to be shared responsibility. Clause 51 of Schedule 8 give power to make regulations establishing deposit return schemes. These schemes can bring about improvements in plastic recycling. Stakeholders raised a number of issues, including issues with the retail sector and space resources to manage the scheme, that councils will be left to collect lower value recyclates and how this will operate locally in light of cross-border issues. The committee recognises the benefit of such schemes and have suggested learning from uh, other places where such schemes are already in place. Clause 52 allows for the making of regulations about change charges for single-use plastic items. The committee notes that uh, in England, Scotland and Wales we are considering restricting certain single-use plastic items. The committee also notes that planned EU ban on certain items where there are currently suitable alternatives that are not made of plastic, such as single-use plastic cutlery, cotton buds, straws and stirrers. Stakeholder concerns included that the cost of this is likely to be passed on to the customer, resulting in higher food prices. Clause 53 allows DERA to require sellers of single-use carrier bags to register with an administrator applications for registration, amount of payment of registration fees. The committee notes that the use of revenue raised from charging for carrier bags could be used to deliver environmental improvements. Clause 56 allows for the establishment of a mandatory electronic system to record and monitor the movement of waste. The committee notes that DERA have indicated that there is a project in place to deliver this system. In relation to Clause 58, the committee recommends that the definition of hazard of waste be extended to here in the north. Clauses 81 and 83 relate to water quality. Stakeholders raised a number of concerns here. The committee is of the view that these clauses should be strengthened to ensure targets and standards cannot be weakened without thorough public consultation and independent scientific advice. Clause 125 relates to uh, reach enforcement regulations. Stakeholders have expressed the view that Clause 125 should be strengthened to ensure that targets and standards cannot be weakened without thorough public consultation and scientific advice. And the com committee supports this view and believes that any proposed charges should undergo public consultation. Although legislative consent has not been sought for Clause 59 in the tra Transfrontier Shipment of Waste, the committee also expressed concern at how waste is disposed of when it gets to here and feels that this is an area that needs strengthened to prevent, for example, sea pollution. I will now turn to the final section of the report concerning matters that are outside the provisions of the Bill that will have a massive impact on its operation and implementation. The first of these relates to conventions and international laws. The Environment Bill should not contradict conventions such as the Basel Convention and the Transboundary Shipment of Hazardous Waste and the Aros Convention. Secondly, the Good Friday Agreement for provides for North-South cooperation on environmental protection. The Bill may well, may well have implications for Strand 2 arrangements with regards to the environment, such as North-South cooperation on water quality and especially on the implementation of the Water Framework Directive. Parallel to, the scrutiny of the, parallel to the scrutiny the committee is carrying out the Environment uh, Bill, the committee is also considering the Agricultural Bill and Fisheries Bill. The committee notes that there are implications of the Environment Bill for other legislation and is concerned that the Environment Bill does not dovetail with, for example, the Agricultural Bill, as might be expected. The Environment Bill may have implications for other legislative areas, such as planning. The New Decade New Approach com Commitments are committed to the establishment of an independent environmental protection agency. It also committed to make a number of other uh, changes with regard to Climate Act. More, more information is required as to what ministerial directives or objectives are being set in relation to the establishment of an uh, independent uh, environment protection agency and how this will interact with the OEP if established. The committee also raised a lot of questions around the financing and resources of the proposals, such as the OEP and infrastructure. Finally, the committee notes that the COVID-19 pandemic has brought environmental issues to the fore. This has concluded the positive impacts of reduced travel and the environment, and sorry, reduced travel on the environment and efforts of the community to improve the natural environment through, for example, litter picking initiatives. In concluding uh, my committee remarks, uh, I just want to say the committee has not taken a position on this bill. The committee recognises the risk of governance gaps should there be any absence of legislation to protect and improve the environment here. And that said, the committee believes that an environmental bill 
for this uh, for the North, taking account of our unique circumstances, ultimately is the way forward. And just in concluding the committee's remarks, I want to thank uh, the environmental stakeholders and NGOs who came before us to give evidence, and I want to thank the officials for their work uh, and for helping to prepare these notes. And just briefly, given that that was quite an extensive uh, outline of it, just from Sinn Féin's point of view, uh, I think my starting point is where I concluded uh, the committee comments that this LCM, uh, there is serious risks of government gaps without this LCM uh, in terms of important legislation, but that this bill is a result of Brexit and the majority of people here obviously didn't support Brexit. And the committee outlined uh, the uncertainties and adequate of this bill and those are uh, concerns shared uh, by myself and Sinn Féin. We do want to see a sunset clause inserted into this bill with a short time frame to allow uh, the Minister to bring forward, as he said, uh, additional legislation in the form of uh, an, an environment bill for this Assembly to suit the needs of the people uh, and their environment here. We do live on an island, uh, and as stated in the committee remarks, you know, uh, environment and climate takes no account or recognises uh, no borders. This bill has doesn't take account of the protocol uh, that we will now subject, be sub shortly subject to. And in terms of aggression, we share the concerns of those within the environmental lobby and NGOs that there is the potential for regression from current EU legislation, and we can't allow that to happen. And we would seek a non-regression clause inserted within the, this bill. Uh, in the midst of a health crisis, it is now more important than ever that we don't ignore another looming crisis that of the damage to your environment and to your climate. And that is why uh, we need to see what was agreed in the NDNA implemented. We do need a proper, updated, locally made environmental legislation underpinned by an independent environmental protection agency to regulate this. And finally, all of this needs an overarching Climate Change Act. A Climate Act was promised within uh, the NDNA that brought about the, the resumption of this institution. It was further endorsed by a motion in this assembly and supported by the majority of MLAs within this assembly. And it is an issue that we need the minister to bring forward as a matter of urgency. I call William Irwin. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I welcome the opportunity to contribute to the debate today, and I welcome the minister's comments on this issue today. As we know and have debated on many occasions in the past, in this chamber, the, the environment is a very valued and important asset and must be protected in a meaningful and sensible manner. The Environment Bill is the method with which Northern Ireland and indeed the rest of the UK will protect and enhance the environment, and each devolved region will have the capacity to add to the various measures and powers that can be used to help protect our environment for the years to come. What is important is the opportunity this presents, and whilst everyone will want to maintain all the various rules that are effective uh, at protecting the environment up to until this point, it will be important to have an element of control in which to react to circumstances that may be unique to, devolved region, to a devolved region such as our own here in Northern Ireland. As has been voiced at committee and referred to by a number of people from the era to our committee, the current COVID-19 restrictions have hampered work on the bill and discussions uh, and somewhat or have been delayed uh, its progress so far. Therefore, I welcome the progress on this matter before the House today. The bill will ensure that protection continues for the future post-Brexit and that in Northern Ireland we can better protect our environment with our own tailored initiatives that best suit practices here and avoid cumbersome and non-reflective one size fits all legislation that can on occasions be counterproductive, as was the case with some European directives. A lot of work is still to be done on this issue, and whilst the current restrictions, of course, limiting this work, it is vital uh, that preparatory work and discussions continue in earnest to ensure that we have a workable set of arrangements for Northern Ireland. I welcome the general thrust of the work around this from there and the emphasis that there is no intention of making any decisions that would in any way reduce protections. That should be comfort to anyone 
or any group that may have concerns that this legislation would signal some kind of relaxation of the types of important restrictions or protocols that ensure that our environment continues to be protected. In committee in recent days, we have heard from DR officials who provided important clarity in this exact regard, and they are on record stating to members that nothing in this bill threatens existing protections. This is essentially enabling legislation uh, allow, to allow further work to take place on this very important area of governance. That must now be a real focus for everyone. I look forward to working further on this important legislation. I know that the Minister himself has a real awareness of the issues, and that has underpinned his minister thus far, ministry thus far, and indeed, I note he's even pulled his own canoe in the a few days ago to see firsthand the very real issue presented by waste in our province. That is the sort of practical approach that must underpin the, this progress uh, to ensure that we arrive at solutions and legislation that are effective and both protect, promote and enhance our environment. The environment is our prized asset in Northern Ireland. It must be protected and I support efforts to do so. I support the motion. Thank you. I call Matthew O'Toole. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, uh, we are asked today, I speak, I should say, um, primarily as my party's um, Brexit spokesperson, though I mostly won't be talking about Brexit, the Minister will be relieved to hear today. Um, we are, however, um, uh, asked to debate yet another um, legislative uh, consent motion relating to um, the effects of exit from the European Union. We've been asked to do it, I'm afraid, with, as um, the member from the Agriculture Committee said, with um, insufficient scrutiny and insufficient time to really think through both the, broad, the broader uh, implications of, um, of the legislation and also the specific interactions uh, with the Ireland Protocol. Um, it's important that we acknowledge, and I will acknowledge right at the start, that that isn't preferable, it isn't uh, acceptable, um, particularly because we are going to have, as, as the year goes on, a, a large volume of further um, uh, legislation and legislative consent motions that we need to, to scrutinise, or at least I hope we will, because the executive should be, as we speak, preparing it, although we haven't had very much of an update on that. Um, to move on to the, to the bill um, specifically, many of the aspects of the intentions of this bill are indeed welcome. It is right that if we do have to leave the European Union, and clearly I and my party didn't support it, that there, is a, um, there isn't a governance gap that many of the provisions um, and principles that are currently um, co uh, provided for by European law um, are converted into domestic law, and that being the central purpose of the bill, it's welcome insofar as it goes. However, there are um, very specific um, concerns and challenges. Um, I'll come on to a couple of them. Uh, a, sus a, sus a substantial proportion of um, existing law and policy relating to environmental protection in the UK um, indeed, in all member states, obviously, um, comes from the EU. Uh, its implementation is largely enforced and monitored by the European Commission. Um, this bill, uh, as I said, uh, is, uh, an, intends to replace the work of the European Commission, but it fails as an appropriate replacement on two very critical counts. First, there is a lack of ambition in relation to environmental protection and conservation in Northern Ireland. Um, just a few weeks ago, we passed a motion in this place highlighting um, uh, the need to acknowledge a climate crisis, um, the lack of legally binding targets, commitment uh, and lack of commitment to non-regression non of environmental standards in this bill is deeply disappointing. Um, and We should be aware of that as we wave through this, um, this legislation tonight, this, this legislative consent motion. The failure to properly consider the need for specific um, measures and in specific infrastructure, uh, environmental infrastructure in Northern Ireland means that this bill simply doesn't, protect, doesn't provide adequate protection uh, for our environment. And indeed, there are very few guarantees, other than some of the uh, verbal uh, guarantees we've had from uh, DEFRA in London, um, that environmental standards will not uh, be watered down. Um, we, are, we are asked, in short, as we were a couple of weeks ago with the Medicines and Medical Devices Bill, to simply take the word. Uh, of the UK government on this. Well, as I said then, um, members in this House on all sides should be well aware of the value of the words of this particular British government. Second, there is a um, distinct lack of clarity from either Westminster or DERA on how this bill will interact 
uh, with the Ireland Protocol, uh, or indeed how its provisions will be applied um, uh, if and when the UK chooses, and I hope they don't choose, but I fear they will, chooses to diverge uh, from EU environmental standards following the end of the transition period. We simply don't have enough information, and it goes to a deeper point, which is the lack of information we have generally about uh, the devolved institutions, their application of the protocol, and indeed the UK government's willingness to stand behind those provisions. Um, uh, this environment bill, as I said, is yet another example of our Assembly having to wave through Brexit-related legislation without real scrutiny and with little information on how it will impact upon our environment and what it will mean for our agriculture industry. Philip McGuigan offered the example of water quality. We are asked to take the word for it that um, legislators, uh, that, that DEFRA officials who drafted this bill were thinking about the specific conditions on, on this island, not just the Ireland Protocol, but the simple fact that the water in Carlingford Lock, the water in Loch Foyle, the water in Loch Melvin doesn't, sub, doesn't change at the border. We need to have a properly thought through uh, joined up approach to understanding not just the implementation of the protocol but how environmental standards can be managed on an all island basis. That isn't a nationalistic point, it's a simple fact of being on an island and sharing, not just sharing national resources on an island, but sharing national resources that are completely seamless across the border. The word seamless is an absurd thing to say, of course, as I've said, the, 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 um, the, the, the fish in Loch Melvin and the oysters in Carlingford Loch aren't paying attention to which side of the border they're on, I'm afraid, and we shouldn't. And, and, and we can't, uh, I'm afraid, expect them to. Um, so to go into a little bit more detail uh, on those two um, critical failings I've talked about, first, the lack of any real ambition for Northern Ireland in terms of environmental regulation. Environmental uh, governance in Northern Ireland has been historically weak, um, uh, not just internationally, but uh, frankly in relation to other parts of the UK. We are the only um, uh, uh, devolved uh, area of the UK that does not have a separate, uh, and not just devolved area, England has its own um, uh, environment agency. We don't, are the only bit that doesn't have our own separate and independent statutory uh, conservation body. That's absurd, frankly. That's absurd and it's overdue. Um, with the UK's exit from the European Union, environmental law and governance is going to become even weaker. And it started, I'm afraid, from a weak place. Uh, representatives of the local agriculture and environmental uh, sectors have expressed their concerns that this bill is uh, both incomplete and it's, uh, remo and, it's, um, and, it's, uh, rem and it's removed from the specific challenges we, we, we face in Northern Ireland. And, and I thank them for the engagement I and my party have had with them in recent days. As has also been said, there is no commitment in this bill to non-regression of environmental standards. Uh, part of the reason why this is particularly critical is that environmental standards are, as the Minister will well know, completely intimately linked with um, uh, agri-food standards in terms of the production of uh, food. When it comes to the development of new trade deals that the UK will seek to um, sign, we need to have absolute certainty um, that standards, whether they're environmental standards, whether they're food standards, or whether they're labour standards, frankly, will not drop, and we simply don't have it. At the minute, we have verbal commitments not to regress on EU standards, um, but the, environmental bill, the Environment Bill fails to enshrine this in law, uh, either in Westminster or in Northern Ireland. Uh, an effective environment strategy needs to be underpinned by local legislation. As has been said, this bill contains no statutory basis for environmental plans or binding targets. Uh, in relation to the governance gap, um, though I am uh, glad that there is, will be at least some legislative provision to um, cover the period when the UK leaves the European Union. As I said, there, there does need to be some form of continuity in the statute book. This bill does not sufficiently uh, clarify issues around resourcing, um, nor, uh, nor the interim arrangements for the, for the proposed OEP in Northern Ireland. We are losing the, the oversight and enforcement role of the European Commission and the uh, European Court of Justice. Um, that new body, the OEP, will be established uh, uh, for England uh, with, um, uh, with amended function for Northern Ireland to take on some of the EU Commission rules, but there remain serious concerns regarding its independence and its uh, robustness. There is no guarantee either that the OEP will be operational here by the 1st of January, meaning we may still have, the Minister may be able to give some clarity on that uh, this evening, um, the, meaning there may uh, be a significant uh, environmental governance gap if those structures are not in place. Um, environmental organisations here have argued robustly that that OEP needs to be fully independent of government and have stronger enforcement mechanisms. 
and we support their calls. The OEP uh, will only be able to issue notices in the case of breaches or initiate judicial review proceedings, uh, which are both a lower standard than the current uh, powers that the European Commission holds. That might be the um, uh, desire of um, uh, Brexiteers in London who wish to um, maximise freedom in terms of uh, lowering regulation, but it shouldn't be uh, what we want to do here. Frankly, it shouldn't be what we want to do anywhere in the UK in terms of um, uh, guaranteeing environmental standards. Um, uh, and to reinforce a point that has been made also by Philip McGuigan, which we support, and many others in this House, there's no, bizarrely there's no one from the Green Party here, but I'm sure they would support the case, the case for an independent environmental protection agency. Um, oh. Should have given me a point of order. My apologies. I put on the record my apologies to the leader of the Northern Ireland Green Party, um, uh, who I'm sure would support me in my calls for an independent environmental protection agency for Northern Ireland. We are, as I said earlier, currently the only country in the UK that doesn't have one. Um, many of the policy principles in this bill were consulted on at a UK level, as I said, um, while uh, Northern Ireland was without an executive. Um, so parts of the LCM are uh, create a challenge for specific parts of industry here. I'm sure the minister has consulted uh, specifically with, um, in, in terms of the, the food and drink industry around packaging and their specific challenges they have. I'm sure he's engaging with them on it. Um, I'll move on briefly to discuss uh, the cha challenges around the protocol and the lack of um, consideration of the Ireland protocol in, in relation to the delivery of this bill. It was developed, as I said, uh, without, so far as I'm aware, uh, unless I could be told differently, specific detailed consideration of the application of the Ireland protocol or the post-Brexit position of our environmental and agriculture sectors. Um, that is frustrating, and it's particularly deeply frustrating given how little time we've had to consider or scrutinise this bill. Um, it, due consideration has not been given to the potential impacts, as I said, of regulatory divergence between Great Britain and the European Union. Um, indeed, there's no specific reference in the bill to the, to the protocol at all. Um, if uh, the, there are any attempts to uh, uh, circumvent or, or circumnavigate the, um, the, the protocol in terms of how, the legisl how, how it's applied here, how the regulation is applied here, it will have, uh, no doubt, uh, implications for our access to the European single market, which is uh, one of the advantages of the Ireland Protocol that our producers here continue to have access for it. If uh, there is any uncertainty about um, the application of the protocol in relation to, for, for example, the environmental, uh, environmental provisions and how they interact with uh, food production, that could present um, uh, challenges to our access to that market. I'm sure no one here wants to see that. The list of potential divergence issues are uh, completely unclarified in the bill, uh, it, but they include issues around, as we've discussed, water quality, uh, particularly in relation to river basin districts. Um, so many of which, as we know, are cross-border uh, cross waste disposal, label and package, labelling and packaging uh, requirements and costs, uh, questions around judicial review of branches of environmental law, uh, specifically as it relates to cross-border activity. There is a lack of clarity on who will be responsible for enforcement. Um, there is, as I said, no mention in the bill who will take precedence should, for example, Northern Ireland find itself non-compliant with the protocol by implementing UK law that might um, uh, that may be uh, by implementing UK law that is uh, divergent from EU standards in a dramatic way post-transition. These are all questions that we simply don't have uh, an answer to. Mention has also been made of um, uh, common frameworks across uh, the different uh, devolved uh, regions. Many of the areas under the bill, um, the common frameworks I should say, um, many of the areas under the bill have been identified by the Cabinet Office uh, as areas for uh, common framework. Um, but we still don't have enough detail from the Cabinet Office around those common frameworks. And I'm sure I would agree, uh, I'm sure the, the Minister will agree with me that we do need more from the Cabinet Office on that. So, in summary, while um, I agree with the principle of avoiding um, gaps in our environmental provision uh, post the end of the transition period, I'm afraid this bill is a long way uh, from covering it. Um, uh, I, I can't on the record support the legislative consent motion. We aren't going to oppose it. We aren't going to force it to a, a, um, a division or anything like that. We support some of the provisions, but as I said, this is nowhere near ambitious enough in terms of environmental protection in Northern Ireland, and nor is there anywhere near enough detail in terms of uh, the application of, of, of the, the Ireland Protocol and how it affects um, everyone uh, in Northern Ireland? We need much more from that. We need it, I'm afraid, from the Minister's Department. We need it from the UK Government. Um, uh, and we need it urgently, I'm afraid. Thank you. 
I call Rosemary Barton. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. While we today are debating the extension of, to Northern Ireland of the provisions of this Environment Bill, let us not forget that this bill being brought before you is a very complex one with very limited scrutiny time. There are 57 of its 133 provisions which apply to Northern Ireland. This bill is in two parts, a legal framework for the new environmental governance and accountability, which it is hoped will address any environmental government details that have been excluded as a result of exiting from Europe. In general, the second part concentrates on the improvement of the overall quality of our environment, such as providing for a cleaner environment through better waste and resource management, leading to greater efficiency and an improvement in air and water quality through education, individual, collective responsibility. This second part of the bill also recognises the need for biodiversity conservation to keep our natural ecosystems functioning and healthy. This original bill was, re was reintroduced to Westminster in 2019 as a piece of UK legislation, and this has had Northern Ireland provisions added because at the time Stormont was not operational. As a result, there are several issues within the bill at present that may cause concern for Northern Ireland as it works towards a cleaner, brighter environment. There's concern that the bill as it stands at present, when worked through, may bring about a weakening of the environmental protection, leaving the UK with less protection than that provided by the EU. However, with environmental improvement plans, the importance of maintaining and protecting the environment, hopefully this will reflect that we, will have no con that we do not need to be concerned. There are also uncertainties around the Northern Ireland Protocol. There are concerns that the provisions within the bill makes no specific reference to the protocol which may have implications for Northern Ireland in terms of environmental standards and also in relation to accessing the EU single market, for example, for our agri-food sector. Another unease is that the governance gaps can still prevail because of the exit from Europe. While the environmental bill attempts to prevent these gaps arising through the development of an environmental plan for Northern Ireland, there are still many unknowns. With regard to the establishment of an Office for Environmental Protection, there is no reference to the proposed independent environmental protection agency in the new decade in your approach. Also, there is no reference made between the potential overlap of these organisations and the overlap of the enforcement bodies, such as NIEA. Here, there is a need for clarification about these roles of the organisations and, the and their recognition. It is because of these issues that it may be necessary in the future to bring forward a bespoke Northern Ireland environmental bill, something both Scotland and Wales are working towards presently. Within the bill, there are, there are a further number of clauses specifically addressing, wa addressing waste and resource efficiency in Northern Ireland, which are welcome, including electronic waste tracking, shipping of waste and enforcement powers to discourage waste littering. There's also a number of recycl recyclable and reusable clauses applicable to plastics. Further, there are a number of clauses that relate to air quality through the Clean Air Act, with clauses setting out the requirements for the need to maintain and improve water quality standards. Mr Deputy Speaker, while there are some issues that may be of concern, the majority of provisions are welcome. So the Ulster Unionist Party will be supporting this bill. I call John Blair. Deputy Speaker, thank you. And can I take this opportunity to thank the Minister for the, the statement on the uh, fairly extensive detail given. I rise, Deputy Speaker, on behalf of Alliance to support the LCM, although I should probably say at the outset the, that I, with colleagues, see this as a holding position, an interim measure, a framework on which to build a bill and policies bespoke to Northern Ireland, and that will probably come as no surprise to others, including those who sit on the DERA committee with me. Um, as the only region, Deputy Speaker, in the UK and Ireland without an independent environmental protection agency, 
the Climate Change Act or specific net zero emissions targets. Northern Ireland is in urgent need of new policies that will perfect, protect the environment and restore nature. Some members will be aware that the State of Nature Report 2019 illustrated clearly the alarming rate of loss in terms of habitat and species. This Assembly will, I hope, commit to sufficient resources to honour pledges already made to ensure adequate progress and protections going forward. The proposed Environment Bill goes some way towards addressing the environmental governance gaps that our exit from the European Union exposes. However, there are a number of issues that remain and which need to be addressed. We need mechanisms for ensuring that future environmental improvement plans are sufficiently ambitious, deliver meaningful improvement and are relevant to Northern Ireland. Clarification is required around the relevance of and the role for Northern Ireland within the proposed Office for Environmental uh, Protection, EPO, and how that sits with the Indep Independent Environmental Protection Agency here in Northern Ireland, as promised in the New Decade New Approach Agreement. Furthermore, the Environment Bill outlines that there will be one Northern Ireland representative on the OEP regulatory body. Um, and the obvious questions stemming from that are, who will that be? How will they be appointed? And from what sector will they come? The process for appointment, at this stage at least, is completely unclear. The Environment Bill also tells us that DEFRA will every two years report to Westminster on international environmental protection legislation. That does not, it appears, cover Northern Ireland-based detailed scrutiny, and that's another concern of mine. There are, Deputy Speaker, however, some positives and areas of the Bill uh, which are appropriate to Northern Ireland, which address the specific environmental governance challenges. I am pleased to see the inclusion of polluter pays principles, considering the, the legacy of environmental problems such as river pollution, and I look forward to seeing the policies and the will to carry these through. The bill also, obviously, as I referred to a moment ago, gives us some continuity on environmental protection from the date of EU exit. Uh, on the subject of that EU exit, Deputy Speaker, Northern Ireland is the only part of the UK that has been referred to already here this evening that shares a land border with a European Union member state, um, which gives added importance to the need to maintain existing EU standards and to improve upon those further. This also gives us a, a caution, a serious and timely caution, on non-regression. The Republic of Ireland will still be operating under the EU framework and if Northern Ireland has a significantly different legislative framework or lower standards, it could be more challenging for us to work collaboratively with our neighbours to protect our shared environment. Few would doubt, whatever drawbacks there have been, the existing threat of EU fines over the years have served as an effective deterrent on many environmental protection matters. I would have preferred a non-regression clause to be included in the Bill and I hope that subsequent bills, strategies and policies can address this shortfall. So, Deputy Speaker, with a view to those future solutions and improvements, and to build upon recent positive statements and initiatives from DERA, and despite the concerns I have expressed, to ensure the cover going forward, I am happy, on behalf of Alliance, to support the LCA. I call Sinead McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your statement and briefing, uh, very detailed. But this LCM is another unfortunate example of a bill that we have been unable to get enough clarity around. And it is one more indication um, that the UK government is facing in several different directions at once. Wales and Scotland are developing their own environment protection agencies, and no wonder. Let us recall for a moment the New Decade New Approach Agreement, which the UK Government devoted immense time to. It referred very explicitly to the environment and to the climate change. Let me quote from the New Decade New Approach. It said, the executive should bring forward a climate change act to give environmental targets a strong legal underpinning the executive will establish an independent environmental protection agency to oversee this work and ensure targets are met. When the SDLP held the ministry, attempts were made to progress both of these hugely important environmental initiatives, but inexplicably they were thwarted and blocked um, at the executive level. We need to resurrect the commitments um, made in the new decade, new approach. 
It is obvious, and it should be obvious, to the British government that the situation in Northern Ireland is different from that in England. We have a land border. We have cross-border production built into the agri-food sector. Much of the environmental matters underpinning this legislation is different here than it is over the water. Yet we have so little time to properly scrutinise the legislation. We don't have the, proper, or the opportunity to consider in detail the specific implications for Northern Ireland of this um, legislation. And, and, and Mr Deputy Speaker, this just isn't good enough. We will support this LCM, not that we are totally happy, uh, with the contents, but the alternative is um, to have no environmental governance. Mr Deputy Speaker, the SDLP will be seeking to make amendments to this bill in Westminster in order to make improvements uh, that would have more cognizance with our unique position here in the North. Thank you. I call Claire Bailey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, this Assembly has been asked to endorse the extension of these provisions to Northern Ireland, but I feel that these extensions are subpar provisions. They are still under scrutiny in, in Westminster, yet we have been asked that we need to rush them through here, um, despite knowing and being told that um, we are doing so without adequate scrutiny of our own. So why are we being asked to endorse provisions that aren't even law yet, but that also do not work for us in our context. And most importantly, we still have the option to amend and improve them. I have listened to the Brexit and Environment Group, and they have spoken of their concerns that this legislation has been developed for England, made common by default, fine-tuned for England, but not tailored to the needs of Northern Ireland. But this is hardly surprising given the absence of an executive during the Assembly's three-year hiatus and the lack of formal public consultation at a Northern Ireland level on the principles and governance aspects of this bill. We are facing huge issues in terms of governance and enforcement gaps here, and the provisions extended to Northern Ireland do not, adequ do not adequately address these in the bill's current form. This bill and its provisions as they relate to Northern Ireland, as they stand, are simply not good enough. It does not meet our needs. It does not adequately address the issues that we face. What we need is to develop our own environmental legislation that is specific to our context and it is aligned with the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol. This is nothing close to that. So I find it hard to support this LCM. If we are to pass legislative frameworks to protect our environment, at least let's get it right, because time is running out. So when we look at the protocol provisions, not only does much of this bill not fit the Northern Ireland context, in some cases it limits and restricts it. The Environment Bill's provision, both UK-wide and NI-specific, have not been tested to see if they are compliant with the protocol. In fact, the bill, as others have mentioned, makes no reference to the protocol at all. That's really, quite frankly, unbelievable. We know that adherence to the EU environmental standards contained within the protocol is how Northern Ireland businesses will be able to address or access the single market. We know that Northern Ireland is required to automatically adopt any changes to the EU environmental legislations listed in Annex 2 of the protocol. And we know that Northern Ireland will find itself extremely vulnerable to the impacts of divergence between G GB and EU law. So any such di divergence would have in implications for the protocol and for access to the EU single market. What we do not know is this. We do not know how will the protocol impact upon the UK's ability to create common environmental frameworks. Will Northern Ireland be subjected to enforcement powers, the European Commission and the CJEU for the protocol and the OEP for everything else? And if Northern Ireland finds itself non-compliant with the protocol by implementing UK law or vice versa, which takes precedent? And we do not know the answers to these questions because this bill has not been tested to see how it will interact with the protocol. How is that 
that we are being asked to endorse the extension of these provisions to Northern Ireland when no consideration has been given to our local context. The issue of non-regression has been mentioned by several speakers. And it's hard to ignore the criticisms consistently levelled at this bill by experts charged with its scrutiny. The House of Commons Environment, Food and Rural Affairs Committee has stated that the bill's provisions are not equivalent to current EU environmental standards and that in some areas they mark a significant regression from current standards. This is unacceptable. It is essential that the government commit to non-regression in the Environment Bill. And let me remind you what non-regression is. Non-regression is an environmental legal concept that requires environmental regulation and standards that should not be diminished. A strong version of non-regression does not just prevent a rollback, but requires continual advancement in environmental law and commitments. Experts have told us that non-regression is essential for us to meet environmental obligations. So how then does the Minister account for the fact that this bill contains no non-regression provision at all for Northern Ireland? Government and department officials have indicated that they have no intentions of weakening environmental protections. This should not need to be explained, but it seems that it must. Aspiration and intent do not equate to legislative protection. Northern Ireland is facing monumental environmental disaster. 98% of designated special areas of conservation here exceed critical levels of ammonia. More than one in 24 deaths here are linked to air pollution. And if we keep going along our current trajectory, a considerable proportion of this region will be underwater by 2050. Intention is all well and good, but let's be honest. There is also form here. Our track record is dismal. How can we trust that there will be any change when time and time again we have allowed environmental destruction to occur unchecked? Aspiration is inadequate. We need a straightforward and substantive commitment to non-regression of environmental law written and included in the provisions for Northern Ireland. The Minister must do his job and get this law right. That is how we will get this done. Anything else and anything less will just not be good enough. There are other issues to touch on, such as agriculture and fisheries. Not only does this bill not align with the protocol, but it does not even align with the other bills, the Agriculture and Fisheries Bill that we have also been told that we have to pass legislative consent for. We are passing laws that are contradictory to each other, and we have no provision to monitor their implementation and revise them when they are not working. And it should also be noted here that after this House gave legislative consent to the Agriculture Bill, Westminster, we're still working on it, is still working its way through the, the committee stages and the Commons. Um, and after we'd passed legislative consent, Westminster then voted with the, the support of the Minister's party colleagues there to then lower environmental and food standards contained within it. So I'm calling upon the Minister to address this by engaging with Westminster to ensure that we have laws that work in practice. We look at water quality, and it was absolutely great to see the minister pictured yesterday in his kayak on the river with local people cleaning up the river ban. And while we share the minister's concerns at the shock and levels of pollution and waste in our rivers, we're not equally as shocked because we know we've been watching, we see it, and we hear from people as they continually tell us about the pollution and the damage and the waste in our rivers. Our waterways are already in a deplorable condition, with only 31% of our rivers classified as being in good or better condition. The River Fawn experienced five major pollution incidences between Monday and Friday last week alone. Five last week alone. Is the Minister working with his executive colleagues and the Minister for Infrastructure to stop this happening, to identify the polluters and to hold them accountable? 
In this bill, this bill gives DERA the power to change regulations around the protection of our water. However, there is no requirement for these changes to be positive. Yet we see we need to see clear commitment within this bill to make sure that any change to water regulations and any standards be positive. And I'm calling for the Minister to act to ensure that this is the case. And secondly, there is a simple reality that is not being engaged with here, and that is um, that we do live on a shared island that's not contained within this bill, but that is our context. We share our nature and biodiversity, our air and our waterways. We share three transboundary river basins with the Republic of Ireland. Changes to the way we monitor water quality and any weakening of standards will affect those north and south of the border. At a time when north-south collaboration is so critical, why are we creating barriers to this cooperation on shared environmental issues? And I want to mention RS rights, and I know that the Vice Chair of the Committee mentioned this as well, because the removal of RS rights from this bill rights relating to public participation, public access to information, public access to justice is a matter of huge concern for me. Article 8 of the Harris Convention, to which the UK is a signatory, requires effective public participation in changes and decisions that can significantly affect the environment. And yet, no public consultation took place at a Northern Ireland level on the contents of these provisions. So does the Minister agree that these rights are important? Can he enlighten us as to why no mention um, of the Convention um, is here? Why has that been removed? So maybe in conclusion, the evidence of this bill I find quite damning. This bill and its provisions relating to Northern Ireland are not good enough. The Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol has either not been considered or just not been addressed. There is no substantive commitment to non-regression or environmental law in Northern Ireland. The provisions relating to water quality do not instill any confidence that there will be no further deterioration on our rivers and our lakes and our coasts. The questions remain around public access to environmental justice. And let's not forget what's at stake here. It's our future. It's our homes. Are we willing to accept a future outside the EU with lower environmental protections? Because as Greens, we will not. It is my belief and the belief of my party that the provisions of this bill relating to Northern Ireland pose a threat to our environment. But this is not a done deal. We can do better. And here's how. Work to amend this bill. It is great to hear um, from our colleagues in the SDLP that you will be doing that. I'm calling on the Minister and everyone else to do exactly the same. Include a substantive commitment to non-regression. Include a sunset clause for Northern Ireland so that we can create our own environment bill that reflects our own unique context. The Scottish LCM on the extension of the environment bill provisions to Scotland was postponed recently due to their serious concerns raised at the content of the bill. Why can the same not be done here? Fix this bill and bring this LCM back when the provisions that will actually work to protect our environment. Westminster has shown no regard for the consent of this institution for previous LCMs. This one will be exactly the same. As it stands, I cannot endorse the extension of these provisions to Northern Ireland. We have an unprecedented opportunity now to build back better with a just transition. To, do, to not do so would be a derogation of our duty. Thank you. I call Justin McNulty. Um, thank the Minister for his statement today and um, welcome parts of his statement. Unless we act strategically and in harmony across these islands and indeed across the continent, we are facing a climate, a climate and ecological crisis. And in the north of this island, the north of this island's unique and iconic environment will be under significant threat. Decades of insufficient environmental governance have led to significant environmental damage. 
The State of Nature Report 2019 clearly demonstrates that our terrestrial air quality, water and marine environments are suffering, with species and habitats being lost at an alarming rate. Extensive regulatory dysfunction and unacceptable levels of disregard and non-compliance of, of environmental law have resulted in substantial degradation to our environmental and significant social and economic costs also. ENGOs have long argued for regulatory reform and the need for independent statutory nature conservation for a regulatory for an independent regulatory statutory nature conservation body. As the Northern Ireland Environment Agency is an executive agency within DARA, not an independent body, and only has limited functions. We are the only part of these islands without an independent public body charged with protecting and enhancing the environment. The majority of environmental law here comes from the EU, and we have benefited from the further environmental governments provided by the European institutions, in particular the European Commission and the CJEU. The significance of this oversight is highlighted within national UK law, does not, sufficiently enforced, does not sufficiently enforce environmental law, nor provide effective remedies and sanctions when it is breached. Following the transition period, the loss of oversight from EU institutions, for example, the EU uh, Court of Justice, risks further weakening environmental protection across the North, where the threat of fines from the EU has long provided the greatest, the greatest deterrent. There is a clear and urgent need to, to replace that lost oversight of the EU institutions. Brexit cannot be allowed to be used as an instrument to reduce environmental standards. It is more important than ever that we seek to proactively protect, recover and enhance the environment, ensuring nature is in better condition for future generations. We have the responsibility for the stewardship of our environment, a clean, healthy and well-protected environment supporting a sustainable society and the economy. It is our duty to protect and improve the environment as a valuable asset for the people of Ireland and to protect all ecosystems, animals and ecology from the, far, from the harmful effects of pollution. I therefore welcome the introduction of the Environmental Bill and its provisions, but strongly recommend both technical and substantive changes to the Bill to include more detailed and rigorous protective measures to ensure it effectively protects and enhances the environment. The proposed Office for Environmental Protection will monitor and report on environmental progress, including environmental improvement plans and targets, report and advise on changes to environmental law, and take enforcement action on potential breaches of environmental law by public authorities, with its principal objectives being environmental protection and the improvement of the natural environment. If the Environmental Bill is enacted on change, the OAP will be responsible for monitoring the implementation of environmental law and taking action when public authorities are not properly implementing it. The OAP will be able to receive and investigate complaints from the public and initiate their own investigation into breaches of environmental law. The OAP will be able to provide advice and decision notice informing the relative public authority of their failure to correctly implement environmental law. In such instances that there is a serious failure or need for urgent action to comply with environmental law, the OEP can apply for judicial review of the public authority's action or, or lack thereof. However, Unlike the, EU, unlike the EU, the OEP will not have the enforcement power to impose penalties such as fines in instances when public authorities continue to fail to comply with environmental law. This is obviously a major worry, as if there are no consequences to breaches of standards, we may be open to major environmental exploitation. DEFRA have said that there plans for OEP to be operational immediately following the transition period on 1 January 2021. Given this pandemic, is that date achievable and realistic? That is part of the reason why our party have strongly sought for an extension to the transition period. The Environmental Bill does not sufficiently clarify issues surrounding resourcing and interim arrangements for the OAP here in the North. Subject to the NI provisions within the Environmental Bill being commenced, a dedicated member from here will be appointed to the board of the OAP, yet this appointment process lacks involvement or oversight of the Assembly. The Bill does not clarify the timescale for when the OAP is expected to become operational here. As there is no interim governance arrangements proposed, the OAP must be operational by the 1st of January 2021 to avoid any gap in governance. If the OAP does not receive legislative consent and no other governance mechanisms, no other governance mechanisms are established for Northern Ireland, the only mechanism for challenging the legality of public authority decisions will be for the civil society to apply for judicial review, which is a resource-intensive process. There is therefore a significant risk of a widening governance gap in the North in case of a no-deal Brexit. 
While the OAP will provide oversight of the implementation of environmental law as it, currently, as it is currently established within the Environmental Bill, there remains limits to both remit and enforcement powers. Also of concern is the fact that the OAP will be responsible for monitoring the actions of public authorities and is limited to providing decision notices. There is therefore a clear need for the establishment of an independent statutory nature conservation body for Northern Ireland that will monitor the actions of individuals and organisations and can take enforcement actions which can include, amongst others, financial penalties or civil sanctions. An independent environmental protection agency could be responsible for implementing environmental law, for example through licensing, monitoring the implementation of environmental law and taking enforcement actions when individuals or organisations are in breach of the law. This bill provides a framework upon which this assembly could work to ensure the protection and enhancement of the environment. This work must commence at pace. The environment cannot wait. The environmental principles include, including integration, prevention, precaution, rectification and polluter pays and the duty on the Minister to prepare a policy statement on the need to proportionally apply these principles in the development of policy is to be welcomed. Enforcement is key. This bill requires DEFRA in the process of introducing new environmental law regulation to lay before Westminster a statement indicating that Ministers view the proposed bill will not have an effect of reducing the level of environmental protection currently afforded by existing environmental law. This provision does not extend to the North, but will apply to Northern Ireland in relation to reserve matters. This demonstrates a lack of environmental position. Sorry, a lack of environmental ambition. No aggression is not enough. And within the bill, there are currently no provisions relating to targets or time frame to Northern Ireland. The bill in its current form does not achieve what has been promised, namely gold standard legislation, global leadership for responding to the environmental crisis and the world leading watchdog. The Minister should set out a straightforward and substantive commitment to no aggression on environmental law and enhancement of environmental standards in the bill within the Northern Ireland provisions. The duty to apply this on environmental principles should be strengthened to apply to ministers and public authorities in the development of legislation policy and decision making. This assembly and DEER should legislate for NI specific environmental, agricultural, climate change and fishery bills that provide for the protection and enhancement of nature with standards that set the bar high and that can harmonise across this island and this continent. The minister should develop the environment strategy to function as a long term environmental improvement plan. This should be underpinned by an independent environmental protection agency and time-bound targets covering terrestrial, air, water and marine environments. Without these, the government system here will be incomplete and less effective. Sub subsequent secondary legislation policies or strategies that come from these bills, for example, the environmental strategy should be shaped around the principle of non-regression, but enhancement and ensuring the environmental protection is not watered down. A robust Northern Ireland environmental bill will with sufficient associated funding can deliver significant benefits for the environment, our health and well-being, the economy and the prosperity of future generations. We support the LCM, but qualify that. There are too many gaps and too few protections. I call Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. From the outset, I would like to reiterate and emphasise that no formal public consultation took place in Northern Ireland around the environmental plans, principles and governance elements of this Environment Bill. Consultation happened UK-wide, while Northern Ireland was without an executive and with no sitting assembly. It should come as no surprise, then, that this legislation is designed for England. This bill is not tailored to the needs and aspirations of Northern Ireland, and nor do the provisions extending to Northern Ireland adequately address the major issues that we face in terms of environmental protection and the huge governance and enforcement gaps that lie ahead. The legislative consent motion before us today asks if we endorse the principle of the extension of these provisions. Like many others in this chamber, I understand the urgent need to plug the legislative gap that leaving the EU will create in terms of environmental protection, but unlike many in here today, I will not endorse the extension of the provisions of the Environment Bill as they currently stand. This Environment Bill in its current form and the provisions relating to Northern Ireland are insufficient and wholly inadequate to enable us to protect our environment. So to the Office of, the Envi of our Environmental Protection, Clauses 45 and 46 and Schedules 2 and 3 of the Environment Bill deal with environmental governments and the Office for Environmental Protection. These parts of the bill do not address the potential for overlap between the work of an OEP as proposed, 
or indeed an independent environmental protection agency that was promised in the New Decade New Approach document and this Assembly voted for five months ago. Let's be clear, the OEP, as proposed, will have no powers to issue fines, something that even no fines in the EU are rare, removes the threat of fines, which is a highly effective tool. It will simply have no teeth. The bill, as it stands, attempts to address the concerns over the OEP's independence by requiring that the Secretary of State have regard to the need to protect the OEP's independence. However, this could be easily eroded in practice. The Secretary of State plays a major role in the appointment of members. They will appoint non-executive members, who will then appoint the executive members with regard to the funding. Schedule 1, Clause 12 states that the OEP will receive such sums as the Secretary of State considers are reasonably sufficient to enable the OEP to carry out its functions. None of these provisions adequately ensure or protect the independence of the proposed body. There is provision in the Bill for a specific Northern Ireland member to be appointed to the OEP board. But this Northern Ireland member would be appointed by DERA. No provision is made for the appointment to involve or allow involvement and oversight from the Assembly. Schedule 3 Part 1 provides for the OEP to report on environmental improvement plans and Part 2 provides for the OEP to report on monitoring and reporting of environmental law. And These reports are to be laid before the Northern Ireland Assembly and yet for some reason the reports on environmental law are optional, so I'd like to ask the Minister why that is. Schedule 3, Part 1, Clause 3, 6 makes provisions for the OEP to offer DERA advice on changes to environmental law, but there is no automatic requirement that this advice be communicated to the Assembly. Instead, DERA may, if it thinks fit, lay the advice before the Assembly, which is simply not good enough. A crucial element in environmental enforcement is the ability of ordinary individuals to be able to provide information and help initiate actions by enforcement body. This process is facilitated currently by a complaints procedure to the European Commission. This bill provides for complaints by individuals to the OEP, but includes an unnecessary restriction through excluding individuals who exercise functions of a public nature. This will surely limit the number of admissible complaints and therefore enforcement. Judicial review is only an option where there will be serious damage to the environment and or human health, which remains the strongest tool for the OEP and is very insufficient. Schedule 3 doesn't make reference to interim environmental governments arrangements in the time following the transition period, so the OEP must be operational by the 1st of January 2021 to avoid a gap. But Schedule 1 Clause 4 gives powers to DEFRA to appoint an interim chief executive until the OEP becomes operational, but there is no provision for an interim NI member, something that has been suggested by the Northern Ireland Environmental Link. However, overall, having a token member on the OEP will not suffice. An office based in Northern Ireland would be required with appropriate staff and resources to ensure effectiveness. Reporting restrictions on individuals who exercise function of a public nature should be removed and there should be an alternative enforcement to judicial review, at least the power to issue fines. Our core objective for environmental governments in Northern Ireland should be establishing an independent environmental protection agency which supersedes all other bodies something that was agreed in the new decade, new approach, and voted for by this Assembly, I will reiterate, five months ago. Now to the government's gaps. As it stands, DERA did not have, does not have any plans to bring forward an environmental bill for Northern Ireland. If the UK environmental bill does not go forward, they say it is unlikely that there will be a government's arrangements in place in time. You may end up with a gap at the end of this year where we do not have environmental principles or oversight. DERA have also indicated that if the bill gets legislative consent and is implemented, it will not prevent Northern Ireland from making changes to it or doing things in addition that it wants to. However, while the bill offers opportunities to address potential governance gaps that may arise as a result of leaving the EU, gaps may still arise, for example, during the period in which it takes to develop an environmental improvement plan for Northern Ireland or until an OEP is established here to take over the functions currently before, performed by the EU. If the bill passes in its current form, there will still be governance gaps in places where EU institutions have exercised governance functions, such as preparing legislation, conducting evaluations, sharing data or overseeing enforcement. The OEP proposed to address the gaps that will emerge in relation to enforcing EU law, but it doesn't do it in a complete fashion. Other gaps, such as sharing environmental information by a membership of the European Environmental Agency, remains unaddressed. 
There may be also governance gaps in terms of the independence of the OEP and Northern Ireland's limited representation on it, and a number of stakeholders have expressed their desire for greater emphasis on the oversight and scrutiny role of the Assembly in aspects of the Bill, such as the OEP. COVID-19 and time pressures resulting from the pandemic may also impact on the time frame required to make provision to deal with potential governance gaps. And so do the Environmental Improvement Plan. Clauses 45 and Schedule 2 contain provisions on environmental improvement plans which require DERA to bring forward a policy statement on environmental principles. Unlike England, Northern Ireland does not have a current environmental improvement plan. Schedule 2 Clause 1 provides for a plan to be created within 12 months of the bill coming into force, but with the provision that until then the current plan is the default. But as I say, Northern Ireland does not have a current plan. This risks as immediate an immediate governance gap. Clause 7 of the Bill states that the Environmental Improvement Plan is a plan for significantly improving the natural environment, but there is no indication of what significant means or how improvement will be measured and against what benchmark. Lack of specificity I am going to go on for that, can't do that word, in the wording allows scope for trade-off, weakening or poorer performance in some sectors against better performance elsewhere, so as long as the vague overarching goal of improvement is achieved. Improvement from a low benchmark would satisfy, satisfy the requirements of the Bill, but arguably fail to deliver the environmental improvement that is required to meet the Government's commitment to a net zero by 2050, amongst others. And this is particularly relevant for Northern Ireland, as it is coming from a context of poor environmental history and considerable, considerable environmental issues. Northern Ireland needs to improve, but more than that, it needs to be ambitious. And so do the environmental targets and principles. There are no specific targets are provided for in the provisions for Northern Ireland, and nor are any timelines specified. Without targets and timelines, the system environmental governments proposed for Northern Ireland will be significantly weaker than that for England, leaving the Northern Ireland environmental governance architecture incomplete and potentially ineffective. In Clause 1 2, the Bill only requires that at least one matter within each priority area be addressed, leaving open the possibility of a piecemeal approach. The Secretary of State is responsible for ensuring that these targets are met. They can also revoke or lower these targets where costs are deemed inappropriate. If a similar approach were taken in Northern Ireland, the already weak approach to environmental protection would not improve especially if political will in favour of environmental protection declines in the future. Greater reference should be made to the international standards based on expertise, with, for instance, both minimum standards and more aspirational targets, such as the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Schedule 2 Part 1 leaves it up to the Department to decide what data it considers appropriate for the purposes of monitoring environmental improvement but this should not be done without requiring coordination with other parts of the UK, the Republic of Ireland and the European Environment Agency. So where is Northern Ireland's environmental improvement plan? The Department must bring one forward as soon as is feasible. The draft Northern Ireland Environment Strategy could be developed into a Northern Ireland environmental improvement plan if it contained clear targets and addressed some of the core concerns highlighted in the consultation. The Department have already indicated that the environmental strategy could be redesigned and redesignated as an environmental improvement plan without the need for further consultation. Northern Ireland must introduce specific targets, not a copy and paste from the Bill's approach for England, but targets that address the core issues for Northern Ireland. And a Minister and the Department should therefore identify a range of suitable priority areas, building upon those in the Bill for England and extending them to include Northern Ireland's core issues. Northern Ireland should then, at a minimum, set legally binding environmental targets for these priority areas. This bill also fails to include priority areas such as soil quality. Soil health is an essential element of our environment and should be included in environmental targets. The lack of EU-derived legislation on this issue makes the role of targets here even more important. Targets should be time-bound, ideally, and front-loaded. Any review of an environmental improvement plan should be undertaken by an independent regulator or statutory nature conservation body. Policy statements developed on the environmental principles should not be subject to vague proportionality reasoning that allows for a trade-off between environmental principles and economic considerations. DERA should also commit to working with the UK Government, the Republic of Ireland and the EEA to ensure a common approach to data is adopted and enable 
effective cross-cutting solutions to be devised on the basis of a shared understanding of the problem and consistent measurement approaches. The Northern Ireland Act 1998 provides for cross-border cooperation in the field of environmental protection, so we already have it there. In conclusion, Mr Deputy Speaker, the question before us today is a simple one. Will we accept a future outside the EU with less environmental protections? We as Greens will not be accepting this. This bill and its provisions relating to Northern Ireland are not good enough. The proposed Office for Environmental Protection will never fulfil the potential of an independent environmental protection agency that the executive parties agreed to and that this Assembly voted for. The governance gaps, the lack of environmental improvement plan, targets and principles all need to be addressed. The bill's architecture is not suited to the Northern Ireland context. It is not tailored to Northern Ireland's needs. So we are calling on the Minister to fix these problems either through engagement with Westminster or bringing forward a Northern Ireland Environment Bill. We need substantive commitment to non-regression. When it comes to our environment, we must not accept less protection or risk the erosion of our current standards. We must demand more. And for these reasons, I will not be supporting this LCM. And I call on the Minister for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, Edwin Putz, to conclude and wind up the debate on the motion. Okay, thank you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker. And a number of issues have been raised by various members. A number of the same issues have been raised by a range of members, and uh, I'll seek to respond to them. Um, Interesting enough, one of the first issues that was raised is one of the last issues that was raised, and that is about non-regression. We have to ask a simple question to the House: Who's regressing? Who's granting regression? Nobody's proposing regression. There is nothing in this bill which uh, facilitates regression. Regression will only happen if this House decides that it wants to reduce environmental law. Regression lies in the hands of this Assembly. So regression is a straw man and is not something which should have any bearing in terms of what people's views of this bill are, because there is nothing in this bill which creates regression, the only opportunity for regression is if members of this House wish to regress in terms of environmental law. I should say that time is of the essence. So people may have great aspirations, and there is nothing wrong with having great aspirations uh, for the environment. But at this moment in time, we are leaving the um, European Union uh, properly uh, on the 31st of December. We will not do what some members would wish us to do by that point of time in legislation. So we need to do what we can do. And what we can do in terms of this particular piece of legislation is ensure that nothing changes, nothing is reduced, and we are not in a worse position than we're currently at. And that's what will happen uh, by passing this bill. The notion that we can legislate for something other than the OEP is for the birds. Mr McGuigan raised the issue of fines and that the fines were not um, high enough. Now, this was after having raised the issue of the independent environmental agency. Can I ask who imposes the fines? Because many of the fines that are actually passed in law are fines which are unlimited. So who institutes the fines? Is it some politician who doesn't want to fine these individuals enough? Or is it a government body that is influenced by politics? No. It is the independent courts. So if you're looking for independence, and then you complain about people who have independence, it sort of way it doesn't really stack up the arguments particularly well. The EOP can be uh, extended and, you know, to, to uh, an exclusive Northern Ireland body, and this will be something that the Assembly um, can decide upon. If we want to break away, that is a matter for this Assembly. It's not something which we are stuck to forever. A Northern Ireland member will be appointed by DERA. And that member will be expected to have experience in environmental law, science, and under regulation. So that's 
That's, that, that's what's expected of us. In terms of regulatory body dealing with the private sector, NIEA is the regulatory body that deals with the private sector. It has been and it will continue to be. No gap is created by introducing the OEP. The work of the OEP simply replaces the previous work carried out by the European Commission. It doesn't change it, it replaces it. It does the same work, it takes the same actions. Uh, so therefore, this issue about regression um, and uh, a move backwards is not something uh, which can be backed up. In terms of an environmental bill, there is nothing to stop this Assembly developing its own environmental bill. Nothing to stop my department developing its own environmental bill. This is something that we are bringing to you now, which will ensure the environmental protections which we currently have are not diminished. So not passing the bill, as the Green Party might suggest, is foolhardy. It is like Emperor Nero fiddling while Rome burns. Whilst the Green Party fiddles, the environment burns in this instance. So in terms of um, a sunset clause that was raised by uh, some members, I'd have to say, and have to ask a question, what is the benefit of a sunset clause? A sunset clause merely puts pressure on you to reach a particular date. And if you don't reach that particular date, you lose the protections. So having a sunset clause for a bill like this is a high-risk activity. Much better that we have something which offers protections, and if we devise something better, then we put it through this House, and we approve it, and we implement it. But a sunset clause doesn't help us uh, to do that. Some suggested that the bill doesn't provide adequate standards, and I would suggest to the members that suggested that Mr O'Toole was one of them. He's, he's gone now, but he mustn't have been satisfied with the European Union, because it was their laws and it's their standards that we are implementing, and those standards carry on. So. Mr O'Toole, who, who seemed to be very fond of the European Union, um, mustn't be particularly satisfied with retaining uh, the European Union regulation, because this bill is doing that. And again, if there is divergence to take place, it's for nobody else to do it, only this House. So what have we got to fear? Only ourselves, in that instance. We'll be taking over the decisions on environmental legislation from the European Union. And I know that some people were very slavish in terms of their attitude towards the European Union and their desire to stay in it. Have a little confidence in your own ability to make your own laws, to do what's right for your own people, and to respond to people who will give a and to respond to the community's needs, I think this chamber, the people in this chamber, know better the needs of the people in Northern Ireland than a commissioner in Europe who could be from any, any one of 27 countries. Minister, that uh, this House has always had the, the, the power to make the changes but yet we have consistently seen environmental degradation and stubborn levels of pollution um, in Northern Ireland. So while we can look to the EU, we've always had the ability. We've just chosen not to act on it. Um, I, I would have to counter and say we haven't seen environmental degradation. We have seen environmental improvement. Uh, and the member did um, indicate that our waterways and our air quality are not good enough. I agree with you. And I think there is more to be done, and there is more that we will do to improve both water quality and air quality. And we don't need the European Union um, to tell us how to do it. We can know ourselves how to do it, and we need to tackle it. I think that the damage being done to, to many of our waterways is disgraceful. It's horrible, and it needs to stop. And 
you know, we will work out how we can do this better than is currently the case. Uh, but we don't have to go backwards. That is certainly something. In terms of <clears throat> the Independent Environmental Agency, I, I don't have a particular issue about an independent environmental agency. I, I will say this. In England, Scotland and Wales, the environmental NGOs do not hold up the agencies there as being something which is so much better than the work that the NIEA does. So, you know, it is not some, you know, everybody can repeat it, but it is not some great panacea that is going to deliver some brilliance that we currently don't have. We have an agency um, which gets on with its job and is left to get on with its job, and in my opinion, um, does quite a good job. But in terms of the, the, the suggestion for an independent environmental agency, if this House chooses to do it, that, that, that's absolutely fine. Um, but it is not the panacea that some people may make it out to be. It is something uh, which may be good. Uh, but may not be any better than what we currently have, and that assessment uh, needs to be carried out. And in terms of you know, casting unfounded assertions, as some people did, um, on the OEP, we don't have any evidence whatsoever that it will not be independent or robust. The body hasn't even been created yet, and already people are casting aspersions on it that it won't be this, that, and the other. And that is a ridiculous position um, to adopt. So <clears throat> what I'll say on the environment is that I have absolutely no doubt that further change is coming in terms of how we deal with the environment, how we ensure um, that our environment is kept well. Uh, John Blair did raise the issue of the loss of habitats and species. And again, that is something which I hope we are slowly reversing. I launched the Environmental Challenge Fund just the other day. And to do that, I went up to Sleeve and Cloy. And it benefited from the, the Challenge Fund last year. And, and there we see a wide range of species of grasses and flowers um, that we're allowing to promote. Uh, and projects like that are making a real difference. I'd previously been to Glen Worry and seen the project that was going on to, to bring back many of the breeds of ground-nesting birds um, that we had practically lost. Now, I have to be blunt. One of the ways that they were achieving that was by the removal of foxes. And some people mightn't like that. But a ground-nesting bird is easy predation for a fox. And therefore, if you want to have a ground-nesting bird and you want to save those species that have been indigenous to this country, for millennia, then these are actions that you have to take. But I agree with Mr. Blair. We do need to be improving um, those areas uh, and, and bringing back species and, and making habitats which are suitable for species uh, to thrive uh, and to do well. So <clears throat> I, I think that we do need to look at this as a holding position and then engage in how we can carry out further improvement. The border was raised as an issue, and it's not an issue, because all of the regulations that we have have currently come from the European Union, and we're carrying out the same regulations. So the border is not an issue because we don't have different positions at this point in time. And as we go forward, um, I suspect that, that we will face challenges, um, but the challenges may well be people on the other side of the border keeping up with us. That may be the challenge. And one will just have to wait and see. Uh, but there are opportunities that exist there in terms of our environmental improvement plan that we will facilitate and bring in. And that's something um, that we really need to do. In closing, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'd say nothing in this bill lowers protections. There is not one smidgen of evidence to support that assertion. And therefore, those who are voting against the bill are voting against the bill based upon a straw man. I'm thankful that most of the House are supporting the bill, and I believe that this is something that is absolutely necessary 
if we are for real about protecting our environment. Thank you, Mr. Sp Deputy Speaker. <clears throat> Members, the question is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. no. I think the ayes have it. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Ask members to take their ease for a few moments.